Hey guys, this is Scott Horn. Thanks for taking a moment to join us here. With me today is one of my good friends, and as I often call him, my hired gun, as we got him right here, uh, John Mazzell. So John, welcome. Thank you for taking a few minutes just to visit with us today and give us some information. Sure. Um, so John, I I've known you for way too long. <laughs> Uh, John is not only a friend of mine, he is my personal litigation attorney. He is the go-to guy when I have questions. And, you know, in this business, uh, in the real estate business, there are always a lot of questions out there, whether it's corporate issues or contract issues, whatever it might be. Take a moment, though, and just give us just a few minutes of background on, on what you've done. Now, guys, I know you all know I'm an Aggie. John's also an Aggie. It's kind of fun to talk about this is because I'm an engineer underground, uh, undergrad, and John, well, John's really the rocket scientist because he is a physics undergrad who became a lawyer. So you got a very unique scenario here with two guys in the science backgrounds who both became lawyers for some God-unknown reason, but we are. Anyway, welcome, John. Give us some background real quick. Well, thanks, Scott. Uh, well, okay, so I uh, graduated with a physics degree and uh, said to myself, well, gee, I'll go become a patent lawyer, right? And so I decided to do that and went to law school, passed the patent bar, which is a separate little test, and then uh, came back to Dallas, which is my hometown. I figured, well, you know, uh, this is where my family is, and so I came back here and, well, I couldn't get a job as a patent lawyer. So what I did was is I said I just hung my shingle right out of law school and started practicing law right out of law school. And uh, I've been practicing almost 25 years come November. Yeah. Well, that sounds, you know, in a sense, that sounds a lot like me because, you know, I'm supposed to be the engineer who became the lawyer also. <coughs> Came to Dallas, had a job for one year as an in house real estate attorney. And then the real estate crash hit back in the 80s, and you're on the street. And you go have to go out and figure out how I'm going to hunt and kill it on your own, kind of yeah. like you did. And you just go and do it. That's right. And I find a lot of times, Sean, you do that, when you learn from the ground up, you tend to learn stuff a whole lot better because, you know, you don't have the, the higher echelon people teaching you how to do things. You learn every aspect of our business out there a little bit. Well, you're right, Scott. You know, the thing about it is, is that you, I think you learn best from your mistakes, right? So I can, I can, <laughs> the first couple of years I was practicing, there were a lot of mistakes. I learned them and I learned them well. I learned them what not to do. And then, of course, what to do and what and really, I think the biggest thing is, is when you start out like that, you can get taken advantage of a lot of times. And uh, what's important is, is that you learn what to look out for. And I suspect, you know, when you first started, uh, it's kind of probably a very similar experience. Yeah, oh, it is. You know, you have to, to uh, learn how to navigate the business, mm -hmm. whether it's business navigation or the legal navigation because there are people out there that they will take advantage of you of what, wherever you are in, in that career path out there. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, John, I've always heard that, you know, that uh, the best offense is a good defense, right? Right. And so in the real estate world out there, you know, we want to learn how to protect ourselves before we just jump in and get things going out there. And so when I'm often talking to the investors, and especially the newer investors out there, you know, the first thing I tell them is, guys, when you're buying any type of real estate, whether it's going to be other than your personal home, because here in Texas, your personal home is protected under the Homestead Act. But if you're buying investment property, you want to buy that or, or own and operate it inside of the corporate entity. What is your thought on that? Well, so part of the part of my background that I didn't really share initially was is I do about 70% of litigation, civil litigation. And what that means is when there's a contract dispute or there's, you know, somebody's hurt or whatever it is. So I'm very familiar with the concept and the, and the dynamics of, you know, when parties are litigating amongst themselves. But one of the aspects is, and, and that whole litigation process is, is, okay, so what is the exposure of the party, of the parties? Meaning that, so when you sue somebody, you might think, oh, gee, well, you know, I'm going to sue them. Uh, I only... I'm, I'm the only one that's going to get a recovery. If, if at all, it's a zero or I get what I want. But oftentimes what happens is, is that when you sue somebody, they turn around and counter sue. So 
speaking to your question, if you have a corporate structure, right, or some sort of entity that creates a wall between you and your personal liability, uh, it really goes a long way in terms of analyzing, not analyzing, it goes in terms of a long way in terms of uh, uh, determining what your personal exposure is. So naturally in the litigation sphere, uh, you've always got to take into consideration, well, what happens if I lose? And if I lose, what does that mean to my bottom line, my personal bottom line? The, the corporate structures and the various entities basically create a shield oftentimes between the people on the outside trying to sue and the only things that is exposure is the assets of that entity. And so if you have a $5 million in assets that you personally own and they sue the company or the corporation in this particular what particular situation, then your $5 million in assets are not subject to being uh, taken if you were to lose the case. So I get that. So if, uh, if I'm buying a property, I want to buy it inside my corporate entity. Likewise, if I'm selling the same thing, and what I just heard you say also is, is if you're someone who's going to instigate some type of a civil procedure, you may want to think about doing that vis-a-vis -vis some type of a corporate entity also. Otherwise, it could come back on, on us personally, right? Correct. Okay. So, you know, here in Texas, John, there are several types of corporate entities that, you know, real estate investors can, can utilize. Mm -hmm. They can utilize a corporation. Right. Uh, it could be a C corp, as we call it, or they can do an S corp. Sure. It's still a corporation. Those are just taxation mm -hmm. issues. They can form a, an LLC or a limited liability company, right. or they can do a limited partnership. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another one out there. They could put it inside of a trust. Right. And here in Texas, I see a lot of land trusts that aren't really true trusts. They're more of a DBA. But if you had some basic choices to choose between, uh, what would you tell an investor today would be the best or the, your suggestion for a corporate entity? So when I kind of shared with you that I started out practicing right out of law school, one of the things I would do occasionally is form entities, corporations, LLCs, so forth. When I first started there, I guess there were LLCs, but we really didn't do that many. But um, in that context, in that process, I'm oftentimes advising uh, clients about the entities and the structures. So there's really two things you have to be really concerned about when you decide you're going to create an entity to conduct your business, and that is tax and liability. So uh, the, the primary thing, I think, is the, the liability portion. How do I protect my personal assets and only subject the assets within that entity? That would be the first consideration. The second consideration would be the tax ramifications. So to your question, um, what I often tell, times tell my clients is, is to form a corporation. I've seen a lot of people go with LLCs and a lot of times CPAs advise their clients to go with an LLC and then they just create the LLC and file for them. I, to me, the reason why I oftentimes don't suggest an LLC is as many times it's just an individual person. And when you have an individual person um, there's some tax ramifications that actually exist that you can't take advantage of if you form an LLC. Unless you actually file a separate piece of document and, and declare it at subchapter S. Uh, so there are some important legal things you have to do in that context in order to be able to get greater tax advantage with an LLC. So I often tell, t oftentimes tell my clients go with a corporation and then elect the subchapter S selection for the tax piece. But there's also an additional liability um, statute that actually aids the shareholders of a corporation that doesn't necessarily apply to the LLC. So one of the things when you do litigation, oftentimes you see trends in the law. What happens in Texas right now is, is that judges are interpreting the statutes very literally. They're not trying to get behind the legislature and say, well, what do they mean and what really, how does this thing really function or work? So what happens is, is they really only look at 
the statute very literally. So when you look at the business organization code, they have all the different, they have the LLCs and they have the law that pertains to that. And then they have the corporation, they have the law that pertains to that. And then they have the limited partnership and all the law that applies to that. Well, in the corporation section, there's a specific provision in there that says that shareholders are, they get added protection, okay? And if you're an owner of a corporation, you're the shareholder. And, and you probably also do the work of the corporation. That provision isn't found in the LLC or the limited partnership provision. And so right now, there's a case, probably 10 years old, I know I'm getting too technical or whatever, but 10 years old that basically says that that little provision applies to the LLC. I fully expect, if the trend continues, that they will say that doesn't apply to an LLC. Okay? It only applies to the corporation. I'll give you a case in point. This is a completely absurd thing. So when you sue for breach of contract in Texas, and there's only certain causes of actions you can actually recover your attorney fees when you sue, <laughs> there's a provision under the Civil Practices Remedy Code that says that you get to recover your attorney fees if you sue as a person or as a corporation. Now, it had always been that if it was an LLC or a limited partnership, you got your attorney fees. Well, some court about four years ago, probably out of Houston, that basically said, well, it says corporation, it doesn't say LLC or a limited partnership. So they're considering and, and, they, and they basically said, well, you're an LLC, even though you're suing for breach of contract, you don't get your attorney's fees. Now, they just recently changed it. The legislature finally just changed it. But that's what I'm talking about. They're reading those statutes very, very literally. They're not trying to make them function like they would normally. And so that's why I was no, going to I get that. You know, I often tell the clients, John, that, you know, a corporation and an LLC can be the same. A single member LLC is a little bit different than a dual member Correct. LLC. I understand that a dual member LLC sometimes gets some added protection like a limited partnership to a certain degree. You know, I was always taught that the best protection you can have in Texas is a limited partnership initially. The only problem is it's more expensive to set up. Yes. A little more complicated to navigate because you're usually going to have two corporate entities, the partnership right. and the general partner. It's more expensive. And so I always try to tell the client, you know, be smart. Start small and work up. Whether you choose a corporation or choose an LLC, I go, talk to your, your CPA about your taxation issues first. Mm -hmm. If you can have two members of an LLC, it's better than having one, uh, just because of the way things may be handled a little bit differently out there. And, and I'll let them roll from there a little bit, but so many people, they want to jump in, they want everything in the world to start off with. Give me the best out there. I'm going, yeah, but the best is always expensive. You don't need the best. And then what I hear so much of is, well, should I hold one property in one LLC, and my second house in a new LLC, and the third property in a third LLC? I'm just going, my gosh, you're going to be filing a lot of tax returns. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because an interesting provision in the law or the LLCs is you can create what's called a series LLC. You mm -hmm. might be familiar with it, but it just seems to me to be an accounting nightmare. But if you were one of those individuals that wanted to try to shield each individual house separately, You'd form an LLC, and then <laughs> I don't know how they monitor it, or and I don't fully understand it. You really have to talk to a, the lawyers and the CPAs how they actually handle the accounting piece. Yeah. But if you literally set up your series corporation and you follow the formalities very closely, which is which is not necessarily required on the other entities, you can literally shield that one asset in a series LLC. But there's a lot of ways to trip up. In those situations, and then you lose all the protection. No, just briefly, John, from what I understand, you have to keep separate accounting on each series, but you can have a singular bank account per se. You file one tax return. Right. My only issue I've ever had with a series LLC is, is has it really been tested in Texas yet or not? No, I don't and I haven't seen that. And when I don't have a definitive answer to go off of, I default to things we know. That's Corporation, standard LLC. Right. You know, until someone says otherwise, that's 100% good, go that way. And from there, I let the individual investor kind of make their own decisions. But what I've heard you say is always control your assets inside of a corporate entity of some type. Choose it right, choose it well. Yes, you should do your business through a corporate entity or, or another entity, whether it be an LLC, a limited partnership, or a corporation. Yeah. So as we get into this a little bit, John, you know, you start with 
forming a corporation or an entity. From there, I'm, I don't want to get off in the weeds here about financing properties per se, whether you finance them in your personal name and then transfer into a corporate entity, that can be done. I know mortgage companies will only finance properties in your personal name, they won't <coughs> do it in your corporate sure. name. Your commercial banks, they don't care, they'll do it anywhere. They're going to be signed a personal guarantee anyway. Bottom line is just make sure you have that corporate entity out there. Set it up, talk to your financial planner about right. that, your tax repair, about your, your tax scenarios, and then move forward with the right decision that's right for you. You know, and, 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 and a lot of this discussion, because I do litigation, and, and so I see it when it kind of blows up, right? When the whole situation blows up. And I've done lots and lots of real estate type transactions where they've blown up. But when you think about what, you, what the lawyer thinks about, the litigation lawyer, is how do you manage the risk, right? That's really what we're talking about. And the very first step is, is managing your personal asset risk, or the risk to your personal assets through an entity formation. Yep. I totally agree with that. You know, the other thing is, is we, we were talking about earlier was about, you know, what do we do to protect ourselves out there? And so it all starts to me with when you're going to go out and buy a property and you're going to go to contract, you need to make sure you know what the heck you're doing and how to set up that contract. I see so much stuff out there in the marketplace. You know, I see these one-page contracts, these three, four-page contracts that people pulled off the internet, things they drew up themselves. Oh, yeah. And of course, when I'm reading it, I'm going, where in the world did this come from? Oh, yeah. So what do you suggest the investors do out there when, you, when they're starting to buy that house the first, first time out of the shoot? Well, don't go to Google. <laughs> That's what I would say. Rule number one. Uh, and here's why, I mean, I, I have a case right now where I'm actually suing on behalf of the homeowner. Uh, I, I do both sides, but in this particular situation where the investor basically pulled a document off of Google and it was a loan document and she, I guess, wanted to save the money on the lawyer. And so she, she went to, you know, Google and pulled this thing down and she wrote this thing. And at the end of the day, she was charging like 60, 70% interest. Whoa. It was bad. It was really bad. And then when you looked at it, there was a, it wasn't structured the right way. She should have gone to a lawyer, and now she's in a big mess. And she's in. She's gonna. She's gonna take a hit on this. So guys, the bottom line is, you can't charge sixty or seventy percent interest on any transaction, <laughs> at least not here in <laughs> Texas, and probably not anywhere in the United States as well. Although it sure would be nice to be able to do that once in a while. And I get that, but I see that so often. And you know, unfortunately, I say this about myself as an investor. I am cheap. I try to save a buck wherever I can, whether it's in buying a house, selling the home, the construction process, where it might be. But every once in a while, it's smart to spend a little bit of money for the right thing, for the right advice, right? Well, right. I mean, look, I mean, if, if we're talking about real estate, uh, what do you start? You start with the foundation. If you have a crummy foundation, the walls fall down. And in this, and we start with the foundation of an entity, because we're really what we're talking about is the managing the risk. We start with the with the foundation of an entity, and then we start working off of that. We might put peers under it by basically, well, you know, the contract, I mean, you could envision, I mean, just coming up off the top of my head, but the contract basically forms the wall of this, of this property. And so the point being is, is if, you're, if your contract's no good, if your contract's bad, then you're gonna have a lot of problems. There's a lot of avenues to have problems. Yeah. Well, no, here, I, I always, when I put on classes and talk to people as well, I'm always telling people, guys, use the state promulgated form if you have one. Here in Texas, it's a TREC one to four family contract. Why? Why well, would you tell investors to do that? Well, so, <laughs> so I always hate saying this expression because it always makes my clients and everybody nervous, but I had a judge, a smart judge, he's retiring this year. He told me that the contract is the roadmap to the lawsuit. Now, everybody thinks, oh, if, I, if that's the roadmap to the lawsuit, I don't want a contract. Well, now, what that means basically is, is that um, if everybody does what they're supposed to do, you don't have to worry about the contract terms. It's only when one party or the other doesn't do what the contract says, doesn't do what they promised to do, that you need the contract. And then, what's exhibit number, what's exhibit number one? The contract. What do the parties agree to? Who's gonna win or who's gonna lose based upon that contract? 
And what happens oftentimes is, is that's really important. So when we think about the contract, what do you use? Do you sit something off of Google or do you use a state promulgated form? I would rec I would go with your recommendation, Scott, because here's the thing. Judges understand that document. They've seen that document. They've probably entered into that document. So they're familiar with that document. And so when interpreting that con contract, they're going to be very familiar with it. If you're using new, brand new language that's outside that contract, now all of a sudden the, the judge is going to have to try to get into the weeds and try to understand what the parties meant. And the judge oftentimes is the guy who decides what the contract means. That's the law. No, and I, I, I totally agree with that because I also, you know, go back to what I said. You know, investors are cheap. We want to save a buck. Sure. Well, if you want to save a buck, do the right kind of contract up front because if you bring me a contract that came up with Google somewhere and I have to either read it, review it, or close it, all of a sudden I've got to stop, read the whole thing, charge fees for that, right. as opposed to that promulgated form that I get it, I know exactly what's in it. Right. So it's a money saver really in the day, but it's also the smart play to go with. Well, and here's the other great thing about the promulgated form, Scott, I mean, you, you know this, there's little boxes with, I mean, every, all throughout it, there's a little place for you to fill something out. And so, like, you don't have to get creative. You just have to follow the contract paragraph by paragraph and make sure you check the box or put the put in a date for the closing date. It's all there for you. No, I, I agree. And I also tell clients, John, that use that promulgated form. And I get it. There may be some things you want to add to it. And if there are, there's either a place to do that and mm -hmm. special provisions in the, the track form. Or do a simple addendum. Mm -hmm. Make it easy. <coughs> but you know, understand what it is you're doing also. And I see so many investors, they don't know how to fill it out right. They're, they're buying a house for cash, but it looks like they're buying it for terms. Right. They're buying it with some form of creative financing, but it looks like a cash contract. Right. And it's just messed up. So they need to stop and, and learn how to fill those out correctly. Right. The other thing I see out there so often is, is I see a lot of investors and they, they want to put $1 earnest money, $10 earnest money. Mm -hmm. I look at that and I'm just going, guys, you know, I, I get it, you're trying to save a buck, but to me that's nominal earnest money. One of the first things we learned in law school is a contract is an offer and acceptance and consideration. Sure. And so what is consideration? And we could get way off in the weeds about that. <laughs> you know, is the obligation to buy consideration? Is the earnest money alone consideration? What is consideration? Is it a little? Is it a lot? What is it? And I'm sure there's a myriad of answers like that. But one of the things I try to tell the clients out there is use reasonable consideration. Absolutely. I think if you can just put a reasonable dollar amount there, if there is a negative issue, because we're in an environment uh, where there may be 10 people who want to buy that same property, and you get the contract signed first, what if the next guy wants to pay $10,000 or more? That seller may go to some sharp lawyer trying to find a way to get out of the deal, right? Sure. And my position is, is eliminate any issues that would allow them to knock out your contract. And, you know, I could go up there and say, well, a dollar's earnest money is not sufficient to buy in the contract. It should have been 100 or 500 or whatever it might be. Eliminate as, that as one of the issues. Don't even let it come up. But what else do you see out there with people who fill out these contracts that create problems that they could do better with? You got any ideas on that at all? Uh, well, you know, I mean, here's the thing. So if, some, if you have a situation where a guy says, okay, I, you know, a seller says, I've, I've been offered $10,000 more, there's going to be a lot of, he's going to want that contract rather than the contract that's $10,000 less. I mean, that's just natural. Everybody's a businessman. They want to make the best profit. <laughs> so the question is, is what do you do? Um, in that scenario in terms of the earnest money. You made a very good point about reasonable. So when you think about, so when you, when you do litigation, a lot of times you think of it, think of a contract in a lot of different terms, but many times when you read a contract, there is a reasonable element to each part of it. You, so if you've ever entered into an employment agreement, a lot of times you'll see this little phrase in there that says, um, something to the effect of we can terminate you for any reason whether reasonable or not or at our own discretion okay which basically means that there's not going to be a reasonable standard attached to that particular obligation in the contract so 
to your point about an amount of money, a dollar or ten dollars, I would go with your recommendation a higher a higher amount. And here's why: for a couple of reasons. Number one, because if it's a dollar or ten dollars, a lot of people just blow it off. The buyer says it's just ten dollars, and they don't actually give the money over. Or what I will see is, and I've seen this on numerous times, is that the seller says, I never got the $10. So you put $10 in there and then you give them $10 cash and then it's a swearing match. Did you get the $10? Did you not? And that's a problem because now it becomes a, a pivotal question in the case because if you didn't give the, you the earnest money, then you didn't culminate the deal. And I have seen that so many times where whether you're a seller or a buyer, the party collects the earnest money yeah. Not the third-party closing agent, whether it's the title company mm -hmm. or the uh, the law firm or it might be out there. And if you don't have a written receipt verifying and validating that someplace, you're in that swearing match. But what we try to do is we try to avoid swearing matches. Well, okay. yeah, because... Well, then no one wins. Well... Except the lawyers. Well, then you get into the, you get into the court, right? And when you get into court, then it's a Those damn match. lawyers, guys. And then it's all about leverage, and then, you know, it just becomes more complicated. So, uh, you know, right, you want to give your earnest money over to a third party, some sort of paper trail. And some people say, well, if I give him a check, well, what if the very next day he gets the $10,000 offer and I never got the check? And now it becomes another square match. So having that money put in with a third party and there being some sort of paper trail, well, even if you gave it the $1,000 check to the guy and he gave you a written receipt and he signed, that's the evidence you need to establish that particular fact that you actually did what you were supposed to do under the contract. And again, I think people try to find ways to do that every day of the week. And the better you can construct that contract for your protection, you know, the better it is for everybody. Now, you made some points earlier about doing the right thing, closing the deal. Uh, it's only when you don't do it that problems arise. And of course, I look at that and go, you know, on a, a contract, you have time frames, you mm -hmm. want to meet those. Uh, in most instances, there's going to be a title company involved and a commitment issue that we we'll make sure you look at that, make sure things get resolved quickly out there. Right. And, you know, if you've got a lender involved in a transaction, you know what they want and meet their requirements so you can do things timely. And when you don't do things timely, you're, you're, you're invalidating the contract possibly. Right. And so if you're going to do that, you got to get extensions, these kind of things along the way. Now, likewise, you know, when you're buying a home, we're selling a home, you know, there are different scenarios. It might be the same contract, but different ways you structure them, right? Mm -hmm. So, John, you know, I, I get all this about contracts and using the right kind of contracts, but when it comes down to the closing table sometimes, you know, there are some things also I find that investors can do. You know, first off, I like to see, see them using the right kind of deed. What kind of deed would you recommend that an investor give a home buyer at closing? Well, I would probably recommend <laughs> one that creates the least amount of risk uh, for the seller, right? I mean, if I'm representing the seller, I would say, hey, you want what's called a special warranty deed. Basically, you're only guaranteeing that during the period of time in which you own the property. So if something happened 50 years before you actually bought it, giving a special warranty deed limit your liability for things that happen before you actually bought the property. Yeah, I like that too. And oftentimes I see them use a special warranty deed. I like to sometimes put in an as-is clause into that deed, which just says added protection. Uh, <coughs> I've got a little form that I use in our companies. It's called a waiver condition at time of closing. Okay. That just reinforces the as-is basis of the sale. Right. The buyer is waiving all the warranties, what we call habitability and merchantability. In other words, I'm trying to find any way possible to curb my rear end because I have never lived in this home. I don't know a lot about it other than what I, I found out about it when I bought it and repairs I've done to it along the way. So anything I'm trying to do along the way, I'm trying to find a way to limit my liability there a little bit. So John, in addition to you know getting that you know, the, the sale documents down right and just putting some things in place to protect us down the road, I, I want to just go back a moment because I just thought about this. You know, I see so many investors who put houses under contracts, and they're buying it from an estate. And maybe that estate has three, four, or five heirs, sure. and they go out and they get 
one heir <coughs> to sign the contract. <coughs> what have they really done? Well, they, they own part of the house is what they own. And uh, you can still make money on those type of transactions, right? But you, you've got to, it's got to be lucrative. Usually what happens is, is that one heir, they understand that the other heirs are missing or that they can't get in, in, in a in a court or a unity, and so sometimes you can buy a percentage of that house, but yet you still don't own it all. But what if they went out there and this house, they want to buy it for $100,000, and they sign a $100,000 contract, they get one of five heirs to sign the contract, and that's it. Are they agreeing to buy that 20% interest for $100,000 now? Well, I hope not, because if the house, you want to buy the house at $100,000, and you're only getting 20% interest of the house, well, you can do the math. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, you see that, and these guys try to uh, enforce their position that they somehow have the house tied up, and they're offering to, to pay $100,000 to that one heir, and they have no one else signing off on it. What do you think happens in those, in those cases? Well, they got to find the other four heirs. If they don't find the other four heirs, and if they don't get those four heirs to sign on the dotted line, then you got to file a lawsuit. Well, can that seller force that that investor to buy their 20% interest for $100,000? Uh, ask that question again. So if, <clears throat> if one heir signed a contract to sell a house for $100,000, can the investor can the seller force that one heir to sign the contract or to buy the house for hundred thousand dollars? So what I think percentage. So what I think you're trying to say is, is that <coughs> can the buyer who bought twenty percent of the house force the other heirs to sell their interest in the house? Nope, just the exact opposite. I'm the seller, you're the buyer. Okay. I'm one heir, and I've got five, you no, know, four other siblings out there who haven't signed the contract. Can't force that that other the seller who sold 20% cannot force the other owners to sell their interest in the property. No, I get that too, but can I force the buyer to buy my 20% for $100,000 if he signed that contract with me? Can't force? Well, hold on. Well, it depends upon how the, how the contracts are structured. If you don't write the contract the right way, you may end up Buy, you know, buying their 20% for $100,000. And John, I'm telling you, as a real estate attorney and title attorney in this business for so long, I see that so, so often. There has been no probate work done. There have been no heirship affidavits or things of that nature to get title conveyed into the heir's names. Mm -hmm. And these investors, they tie up the house with one heir there may be one to five to ten more heirs out there who haven't signed anything. Right. But they're, they're offering full price for that house, thinking they've controlled the whole deal. And of course, I gotta tell them, I'm sorry guys, you got a problem. That's right. And then what so often what I see they do is they run downtown and they file that contract as a memorandum of contract. Have you heard of that before? Sure. So just briefly, what's a memorandum of contract? Well, so, um, so when you file something, you know, obviously if you file something with the deed records, it basically lets the whole world know uh, whatever it is you filed with the deed records. And in a particular situation, when you're dealing with real property, whatever you file, a deed or a deed of trust or some sort of lien or mechanics lien, it typically attached to a particular piece of property. What a memorandum of contract does is, is it has to be sworn to. So anything that gets filed has to be notarized, right, in the deed records. Right. And so they basically prepare a little affidavit. They sign off on this is a contract that I have in this particular property. They file it, and then it lets the whole world know that you've got a contract on that house. particular piece of property. And if somebody comes in after the fact and enters into a second contract with the same seller, you position yourself in a good place to say that you have priority. Okay, I get that. I look at that though, and <clears throat> I've yet to find out how long or how, how long that memorandum is valid for. I haven't found that particular statute per se on that. I kind of treat it like a mechanics lien contract a little bit that might 
-hmm. have validity for maybe a year, mm -hmm. then you can't tie up someone's home forever. They say, well, you agreed to sell me this house and you haven't sold it to me without doing something. In other words, if you're going to either force the seller to sell you the home, right? Or release your, your posi position on the property. And so often, they don't want to do anything. They want to hold you ransom. You know, the, per that the investor who put the house under contract, even though they may have done it wrong, what they <clears> try <throat> to do is hold the seller then ransom when they're trying to yeah. sell out somebody else. See that? Pay me X amount of dollars. And of course, now we're, we're into litigation, right? Well, you're really into negotiation at that point because the person who's filed that document with the deed record department, if they're kind of a bad guy and they decide, well, I'm just going to use that to basically keep the seller from ever selling the property for at least as long as I can. They might be able to extract maybe the earnest money that they set up, that they paid up first, and then they defaulted under the contract, or, well, I'm still claiming that you still, I want to still buy the property, and so that they can basically frustrate any future sell for a period of time. Well, as you know, if, if there's holding costs, and things happen, bad things happen to houses that were vacant, so. You don't want to be in that situation. But you know, I see so often again, I mentioned earlier about these heirs where that investor gets one heir to sign off on their, let's say, 20% interest uh -huh. of a contract. They run down and file it, and then the other heirs get together, they want to sell the property. And I'm just going, okay, Mr. Investor, you have the right to buy that one heir's 20% interest for the amount of the contract. Do you want to do that and close it? Or do you want to release your memorandum of contract? And of course, they still try to play hardball. Well, pay me $10,000 and I'll release my contract. And again, I, I fall back and I go, but Mr. Investor, you've agreed to buy this 20% this interest for $100,000. And of course, what you really wanted to do was buy 100% interest sure. for $100,000. Right. What would, you, what would you tell the investor who filed the memorandum at that point in time? Oh, the one that bought the house for $100,000 with only one heir? With only one heir and 20%, let's say. Well, um, are you saying if all of a sudden they, the, the one heir says you got to pay me $100,000 for my 20%? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. Well, so if you use a track promulgated form, um, the way that it's kind of structured is, is it, it's intended to convey 100% of the property. And so you could argue and, and put yourself into a situation where you could say, look, hey, you've got to deliver seller or heir 100% of the contract, 100% of the house, or I'm not going to pay you the 100000 The smarter way is, is, look, it's just like anything else. If you're doing something complicated and you're not really sure what you're doing or you're thinking you know what to do, you got to seek advice. And if you don't seek, I mean, even I, I mean, I, just today, I had to call a plumber. I'm not a plumber, but I had to call a plumber. I had to seek some, I had to seek out somebody that had better, that had more experience or more knowledge or more skill than I had. And in that same way, if you're in this situation, you're probably going to need to call somebody that's got, that's been down that road several times. You couldn't just stick your finger in the hole in the plumbing? And fix it? <laughs> well, I was going to use duct tape, but, you know, that wouldn't uh, work. Yeah, well, 103 uses for duct tape, right? Exactly. Uh, you know, we go through all this stuff, John, and we try to set up our businesses the right way. We try to, you know, use the right type of the corporate entity when we're buying or holding investment property. We talk about, you know, tax consequences, all that kind of stuff. We try to, you know, construct our contracts the right way when we buy and when we sell. Uh, I'm a big guy about disclosure, ensuring that, especially in the seller finance world that I'm so heavily invested in, always disclose everything the oh. best you can. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have found, unfortunately, that when we live in a litigious society, even though you have the best intentions, you try to do everything the right way, somebody can get bent out of shape. Of course. Whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. And when that happens, you get that wonderful certified mail letter from some law firm saying, you did X, Y, Z wrong. You know, yada, yada, yada. And you're going, what did I do? But as the investor out there, when that letter arrives, and guys, if you haven't got it, 
just wait because you've been in this business long enough, you will get it. What should they do? Well, <clears throat> what I will tell you is, is that if you're getting letters from lawyers, you're, you're probably, you're doing, you're doing all right from a business perspective because nobody sues the guy who's got no money, right? I mean, what's the point of it? So in some ways, it's kind of a blessing but a curse. And it's kind of a marker that you're, you're out there doing enough business. You're either doing it completely wrong or you're doing good business and, you know, it's just a natural part of business that you're going to end up getting a letter from a lawyer about something or other. In fact, you mentioned disclosure, disclosure, because when we think about this whole conversation as we've started from the very beginning, from the ground up, we talk about managing risk because I'm the litigator. That's all what we're talking about. We're managing risk. We start with trying to manage the risk to your personal liability. Then we go to the next step to, to manage the risk by entering into good contracts. And then we go to the third step of managing your risk by making those disclosures, right? Mm -hmm. Because in every, in a, in a transaction, we think about the transaction from the beginning. Who are the parties? Then what are the terms of the agreement? And then the closing, what happens then? And then at that point, when we're either, somebody's either saying, I don't have to close, or saying you do have to close, or after you close, then somebody says you misrepresented something. I mean, I've, I've seen your paperwork, Scott, and I've, and I've been on the other end where there's been a demand letter in conjunction with the transaction, and I can just go to your those things and say, well, that was disclosed. Where's the fraud? Because that's the deal. Once you close, the big <laughs> shtick is by the buyer is I was the fraud. You know, John, I've only fortunately I've only had been sued a few times in 30 years of doing business. Sure. And I know first and foremost, I'm an attorney. Everybody goes, well, you're a lawyer, you can handle it. And of course, the biggest mistake you can make is representing yourself, right? Because guys, if too many emotions get involved in those kind of things, you always let a third party do it who comes in from a totally different approach and it helps clear your mind up a little bit. But one thing that comes to my mind was a property that we had bought, remodeled and sold. And six years later, we had sued for failing to disclose that the house may have had previous termite damage. <laughs> now, the problem there was is I had absolutely no idea. Sure. Uh, apparently, a contractor saw something, covered it up, and went on, and just didn't tell us about it. And you get sued. And it's like, what do you do? Even though you didn't do anything wrong, they still sue you. Sure. And you know, you pull back, and as lawyers sometimes, uh, and, and guys, I do practice law every once in a while, you have to tell a client. Sometimes it's just best to write a check and walk away because even though I had no knowledge of any of this existing, I would have had to retain counsel, I would have had to have defended it, spent a lot of time with another lawyer who may be on contingency, and I'll let you talk about that in a moment. But I had a, a, a plaintiff who really, if I had won the, the decision, had no money. And you're stuck. Oh, yeah. You spend a lot of time and a lot of money to win the battle, but in the day you lose the war, right? Sure. So this letter comes in. What's your advice to the investor when that letter comes in the first time? Yeah, yeah. Just ignore it. Just go play ostrich, right? Just, yeah, just ignore it. Don't worry about it. Nothing bad will happen. Nothing. <laughs> well, you know I'm being facetious, right? I'm just joking around. But here's, here's what we're talking about is managing. I mean, if you get a letter from your doctor that says, there's the sign that you might have cancer. You don't just throw, the, throw it away. You go, hey, I gotta go back to my doctor and find out more about this. And, and, and in the same way, right, if it's about managing risk. It's a lot easier and there are a lot more options to manage the risk of getting into a lawsuit or not getting in a lawsuit based upon what happens and how you respond to the demand letter. I, once you get that demand letter, especially from a lawyer, you need to go get a lawyer of your own to say, what should I do? Because there's a lot of things, it, 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 you may have done absolutely nothing wrong, but here's the problem, as you know, is that once you get into a lawsuit, it's real expensive, and it can be tens of thousands of dollars, and a year and a half to two years of your life, you want to try to avoid that from happening. So when we talk about trying to go the steps up in terms of managing the risk, if, you, if you've got good paperwork, 
the, you're, you minimize the risk of getting that letter from the lawyer. But let's say you get that letter from the lawyer, then the question is, is what can you do to avoid that letter go, becoming a lawsuit? And that's real critical. So they get it, and you know, very first off, they need to come back and call the litigation guy. A litigator. <coughs> you want to let them examine that, what's going on. You don't need the guy that basically put your will together to do that. Okay? No. You, or the guy that formed your corporate. Or you don't call your CPA and say, what should. You might call your CPA because he may have a guy that he knows. But really, what you want is you want to find a guy that actually tries cases and litigates. Yeah. Well, like in our case, John, I get the phone calls from clients who have real estate issues. I try to examine see what's going on, try to try to find reasonable resolution to it to prevent those things from occurring. Sure. But then at some point, I have to say, okay, we need to bring in litigation at this point in time, mm -hmm. because outside of my scope, and they're not willing, they're not budging. And you need someone who can manage that situation right there. You know, because so often what you find out there in the marketplace is you have sellers who have money who are paying an attorney. But then you have sellers who don't have any money who hired a lawyer who's taking the case on contingency. Right. And the whole game changes at that point in time. How would you, what, how, do you, how do you handle those kind of situations like that? Well, the strategy, like you said, you know, the strategy really changes in terms of how to respond to that that demand letter. How do you how do you really respond to that? Well, one of the first things you do, and this kind of goes to my you know you don't you know call your you know the guy that did your will, your divorce lawyer. Uh, there are many times when I get the when I get the letter and I look at it and I look the lawyer up, and he's he's like he specializes in divorce law. And he's trying to want to send me a demand letter on a real estate transaction. Well, I already see kind of the writing on the wall that I don't really perceive the threat as strong as 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 I could. And then I start th and I try to go through this analysis of well, well, how is this lawyer getting involved? So, how you handle a contingency lawyer, like you were saying, or an hourly lawyer, it's completely different because if the person is paying the lawyer those ten thousand dollars, he's taking the risk. That person's taking the risk. At the end of the day, all that money will go down the drain. Yeah. So and 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 the lawyer also has to make that assessment as to well, do I really want to put my time into this thing? Excuse me, this my time into this thing when I may not ever get paid. And so, how you respond to that demand letter? If you're really speaking to the lawyer, this is a really bad case. You do not want to take this case on because at the end of the day you're going to lose all your time and all the money that's one tactic the other tactic is, is if you're if you're trying to speak to the actual principal the person that's actually been aggrieved right you would probably address the letter differently no I would too I look at it, though that you no know, in the litigation world you know, there, there are certain tactical things that we real estate attorneys do in structuring transactions to buy and sell, mm -hmm. so as to try to you know head off issues. But likewise, when that litigation letter comes, you know you want that lawyer who's also a tactician, who can think through that scenario just like right. what you described. You know, it, it, are we looking at this situation or that situation? Right. What really happened? What didn't happen? What are they trying to contend? And is there any merit to that? Right. And so often, you know, for me personally. I get personally involved in that. I'm going, why are you accusing me of doing something I had nothing to do at all? Sure. I had no knowledge of this. Why? And you get up in arms about it. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a way to detach yourself from that and let someone else make much more informed decisions who have that experience out there. Which is why I like having you out there in my, I don't want to say my back pocket, but you're my go-to guy for this kind of stuff because you help take that decision off my plate. And you help me think through things in a different light that I can't do myself. And I like to have investors understand that they need to do the same thing in that instance. Um, what, what else have you seen out there in this world? I mean, I've seen so many things, John, in, in the real estate world. Um, I know I referred some cases to you where we had a seller selling their, their personal home. Gets demand letters claiming that all these things are wrong when at the end of the day they actually fixed them all, and they're being sued for things that they even had no knowledge that even existed or could have knowledge that existed. How do you 
handle those kind of situations? Well, in those types of situations, typically you're talking about a contingency lawyer. So, you know, when you think about the demand letter and what's being alleged in the demand letter, that's the substance of really what's going on in terms of what the complaint is. But as I was describing before, you have this higher level analysis on, well, who's representing, who's going to pay for them to bring the lawsuit? Because at the end of the day, will the lawsuit be filed or will it not? What chances are you taking? And you don't want to be in a lawsuit because it's going to cost you lots of money. So in that situation, if you're dealing with a contingency lawyer, or at least what you think to be a contingency lawyer, you basically try to convince that contingency lawyer that the chances are not good. And so when we think about a real estate transaction, what typically happens in those situations is, is after the deal is closed, many of the, the, the claims that are made are is a misrepresentation as to the quality or, the, or there's some defect in the property that wasn't disclosed. And I've handled many a case like that. And so if you know, or you, you know, if you know there's some problem with the house, you've got to disclose it. It's got to be a material thing. It can't be, well, the grass doesn't come all the way up to the, <laughs> up to the side of the house or whatever. It's something that's material that will affect in a material way the house. Right. <clears throat> but sometimes, you know, I see softening in, there may be material issues. You know, for instance, maybe there is a slab leak, meaning there's some possible sure. water leak underground. And a, a, a buyer comes in, they inspect, nothing is found. The seller knows nothing of it. How would they know about it unless they had actual knowledge? But they still get sued, right? Sure. And you gotta ward that off somehow. But one of the things that when I look at, at these cases, what I have learned, and sometimes this takes money out of your pocket, but it takes it out of mine as well, is even though you don't want to settle these cases because you think you did nothing wrong, mm -hmm. sometimes it's the smartest thing to do. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, look at, think of the contingency lawyer, right? When you think about the contingency lawyer, you know, he's now got $1,000. I mean, just sending the letter out, talking to the client, and having a few conversations with opposing counsel, he's got $1,000 in it. So at the end of the day, if you are able to convince him that it's not a good case and that their chances are pretty slim, you got to throw some money at the lawyer to make him go away because he's the threat. He's the guy that's in the ring ready to throw a punch at you. So um, from that perspective, you know, it's difficult to handle. And I've got clients that have, in the past that have, <laughs> I have a client now right now. It's like that. I did nothing wrong. I will pay nothing more than $500. And you, and you have to convince them that, look, it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars if you don't make this guy go away. Well, I have found that standing on principle, I'm a very principle-oriented person, mm -hmm. can be an extremely expensive venture. Oh, we love you. If you're really principled, I would love to have you as my client. <laughs> Because really, and I've seen that happen, and it, it, it rarely goes well. No, it doesn't. But what I've also heard is when you look at the litigation side of things, and sometimes that's just life, and sometimes we just have to deal with it, right? But if you set up your corporate entities right, mm -hmm. you, you've handled things the right way, and you've been smart, whether you, you buy houses in company A, then you transfer them to company B, wherever the, the liability may have arisen, there are ways to limit liability. It's about being smart day one, not a year later. Right. Trying to do the right thing, know your contracts, know your disclosures, put things together right, get educated. But even when you do that, bad things still happen to good people. Sure. And bad things happen to bad people. Of course. And they probably should in those cases. <laughs> But at the same time, it happens out there. And guys, what you want to know is you want to have the right people on your team when the time comes. You want to have the right real estate people doing the right stuff, and you want to have the right litigation team so you have those go-to people out there to help out. So, John, we appreciate you coming in sure. to talk to me about this stuff. I know we could talk for hours about endless things here. Uh, and again, this is John Mazzell. Uh, he's from the law offices of John Mazel as well. Yeah. His link will be, of course, on our website as well. And guys, thank you for taking a moment, just to, I say a moment, an hour or so to listen to all of this. Hope you learned something today. Thanks.